All right, so beginning there in Acts chapter 8, the title of the sermon is, We Are a Baptist Church. Okay, we are a Baptist church. Now, I've already preached that we are an independent church. I've already preached that we are a fundamental church. Today, I'm preaching that we are a Baptist church. Okay, when you look at our church name, the church in Caloundra, in our logo underneath that, it says Independent Fundamental Baptist. And I didn't just put those words because I'm part of some denomination called the Independent Fundamental Baptist. Each of those words represents some truth that I want this church to represent, okay? So today we're talking about the Baptist church. Why are we a Baptist church? Now, I can give you many reasons, and this could have gone on forever, but I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. But when you first look up the definition, just of any standard dictionary out there, anything that you want to define what a Baptist is, if you just say, what is a Baptist? The number one definition found across the board is this. Those who practice believers' baptism by immersion. Okay? Those who practice believers' baptism by immersion. Now that should say a couple of things to you straight away. First of all, the baptism we practice is not sprinkling, right? The baptism we practice is not pouring. The baptism we practice is taking someone and dunking them out of, under the water, okay? By immersion or submersion. That's what we teach, right? We teach that baptism is by immersion. But the other thing is, it's believer's baptism, okay? So before someone is, is, is baptized, they have to be a believer. They have to be someone that's trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's put their belief, their faith, solely upon Jesus Christ, and these people are allowed to be baptized. And by implication, what does that mean? That means we don't practice infant baptism, right? We don't practice baby baptism. Why? Because a baby cannot believe. All right? A baby cannot put their faith on Jesus Christ because they're not old enough to comprehend the, the, the gospel. Okay? So that's a couple of things. Just by its definition, it, it already eliminates many of the denominations out there. Okay? It's baptism by immersion. It's baptism for a believer. That means that the baptism they're doing, is, that we do, is nothing but a symbol. Because okay? the person's already a believer. The person's already saved. Meaning that the baptism they, they do does not... Uh, is not required for their salvation, right? Now, there are many uh, denominations out there, there are many churches out there that will teach you that baptism is a necessary part of their salvation. Whereas we say, no, it's not part of your salvation. Your salvation is purely based upon putting your faith on Jesus Christ and baptism is just symbolic, right? It's just symbolic of what's already taken place in your heart, you know, that you've put your faith on Jesus Christ. You know, the same way as my wedding ring, you know, is a symbol that I'm married, Right? Now, whether that wedding ring is on my finger or whether it's off my finger, it doesn't change the fact that I'm married, right? If we lose our marriage certificate, it, that doesn't change anything. We're still married, my wife and I. We're still married. So whether that, that, that's on my finger or not, in fact, usually when I'm home, I don't wear my wedding ring because I don't like having jewelry on my hands, right? But usually when I'm out and about, I will put on my wedding ring, okay? It doesn't, doesn't make, mean that I'm, that I'm married and then I'm not married when I take it on and off. It's just a symbol of what's already taken place. And so baptism is just a symbol of what's already taking place when you've put your faith on Jesus Christ. So just, just a definition of what a Baptist is. We are a Baptist church, okay? We are a Baptist church. Now, when we look at Acts chapter 8, if you're still there, look at verse number 12. Acts 8 verse 12. It says, And when they believed, Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So we see immediately that someone that believes is then baptized. Okay, once they've believed on Jesus Christ, they are baptized. And then look at verse number 36, the story of, the, of uh, the, um, the eunuch from Ethiopia, verse 36. And when they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? What do I need before I can baptize? Is there anything stopping me from being baptized? Verse 37, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So the condition was believing on Jesus Christ and then you're allowed, right? And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So there he's expressing, he's confessing his faith on Jesus Christ. So just to reinforce the fact that baptism is required after you believe on Jesus Christ, not before. It's not part of your salvation. Okay, verse 36, sorry, verse 30, uh, verse 30, yeah, 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth, I already read that bit, sorry. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. 
and he answered that I believe in the Lord Jesus, uh, that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. All right? And when they were come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. So just to show you that it was a baptism, not by sprinkling or pouring, but by immersion. They went into the water, and they came out of the water. Okay? And again, I've, I've taught on baptism before. I don't want to rehash my sermon. I only preached on that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but just to reinforce those facts, that baptism is by immersion for believers. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried by him, with him, by baptism into death, that we as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of God, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So again, baptism represents the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is why we practice baptism by immersion, right? Again, I don't want to rehash the sermon that I've already preached, but just to reinforce those basic truths, that's what makes us a Baptist. We're Baptists by definition because we carry out baptism the way the Scriptures teach, by immersion for a believer, and it's not part of your, your salvation, it's just a symbol of what you've already believed in your heart. Okay? Now the question is, well, why Baptist? What about some other name? You know, can this church go by some other label, like a Methodist or a Presbyterian church? things like that. Well, I got a list off the internet, a list of all different types of denominations. It includes some cults as well. And just basically what they teach about baptism, okay? And why we're not like them. Why we're not some of these churches, okay? First of all, there are many churches out there that teach that baptism is a requirement for your salvation, okay? You need to get baptized. And if you're not baptized, you're not saved. Some of those churches, obviously the Roman Catholic Church, Okay, the Eastern Orthodox Church or the Greek Orthodox Church, very similar to the Roman Catholic Church. That's why they, they baptize babies, right? Just in case the baby dies prematurely, they say, well, at least he got baptized, he might make it to heaven or, you know, he won't, he won't go to hell, he go to purgatory or something like this. There's the Christadelphians, they believe in baptismal regeneration. The Mormons believe you need to be baptized. And that's why the Mormons even baptize for the dead, right? They baptize for the that for the dead relatives that didn't get baptized, they get baptized on their behalf because they think that's going to get them to heaven. There's the community churches, I'm not that familiar with them, Disciples of Christ, the Four Square Gospel Church. Um, I had friends that went to that church, I didn't know they believed this. Uh, Grace Communion International, uh, the Jehovah Witnesses believe you need to be baptized for salvation. Well, the Jehovah Witnesses believe that that's part of your salvation. You've got to just keep going. Like, you know, that doesn't seal the deal, but you need to do that, otherwise you won't make it. Um, the Lutherans believe in baptismal regeneration. The Methodists and the Wesley, Wesleyans. Um, the Metropolitan Community Churches. The Nazarenes. The Oneness Pentecostals. The, the Standard Pentecostals. Well, it varies from church to church. Some do, some don't believe that baptism, water baptism is required for salvation. And the vineyard churches, the vineyard churches. Uh, some of the other churches that believe in baptismal regeneration that were, were on this list, but I'm not sure if these are accurate because I know some people from this. First of all is the Church of England or Anglican, right? Um, the, the list said most of them believe that, okay? Um, that, that could be true maybe in England, I don't know. But my experience with Church of England, my experience with Anglican, um, is that many of them do not believe you need to be baptized. In fact, if I go, if I go back to Sydney, in all, my, all the soul winning that I was doing door to door, most of the people that I saw saved, already saved, were actually Anglicans. So I'm not sure if maybe there's a bit of a difference here in Australia. I mean, they knew it was by faith alone, they knew it wasn't by baptism, they knew it was eternal security, they could never lose it. Uh, many of them, actually. Uh, so I'm not sure. I even grew up going, to, in my public school, my primary school, I grew up going to an Anglican scripture class. And I remember that very clearly being taught salvation is by faith alone and nothing else. Just very clearly being taught that as a child. Um, and, but the ladies that were doing the class, they were also involved in my local Baptist Union church. So I'm not sure if maybe they, they had a bit of Baptist stuff rubbed into them as well. So I don't know. Um, the other church were the Brethren Church. Um, on this list, they said they believe in baptismal regeneration. But again, the, the few brethren that I do know, or ex-brethren I do know, didn't believe that. They believed that it was by faith alone. And Churches of Christ, 
Many of them, and again, churches of Christ, it depends on the church. Some of them do, some of them don't believe in baptism and regeneration, but I think most of them do. Okay, so that's why we're not part of those churches, all right? That's why I would not fellowship with those churches because they add works to salvation, okay? We're not part of that group. Then, if we move away from there and we say, well, these are other churches that um, don't believe in baptism and regeneration. They don't believe you need to be baptized to be saved, but what they do is they baptize infants instead, right? They baptize infants. And we don't baptize infants because we believe in believer's baptism. You have to believe before you get baptized. Some of these other churches are the United Church of Christ um, uh, and the Presbyterian Church. Okay? They don't believe that it gets you saved, but they believe in child baptism because they, they link it somehow to circumcision, you know, child circumcision. Um, and then you've got your modern-day Anabaptists. Your modern-day Anabaptists, they do sprinkling. Okay? They do immersion as well, but they also do sprinkling, so we're not a modern-day Anabaptist. And then we're left with a few churches, right? We're left with the Baptists. So now these are churches that believe it's not for your salvation. They believe it's for believers only, and they believe it's by immersion, okay? So we're left with Baptists, which is what we are. Calvary Chapel, but I reject Calvary Chapel because they basically, they, they hold on to the charismatic teachings of the tongues movement and, you know, speaking in tongues and the different Holy Spirit gifts and things like that. Um, so, I mean, I reject that. There's the Christian Missionary Alliance, never heard of them. Evangelical Free Church, never heard of them. You've got the Seventh-day Adventists. But again, I don't know if this is true because the Seventh-day Adventists that I've met did say they believed baptism was for salvation. So I'm not sure if this list is pure, you know, 100% accurate or not. And then the United Church of God. Um, now, the reason why we're not a United Church of God is because they believe in biny, uh, binitarianism. binitarianism. Instead of being a Trinitarian church, they believe only the Father and Jesus Christ are persons, right? And that the Holy Spirit is just this power, right? It's this impersonal power, this impersonal force. So we're not, we're not them either. So you can see, once you, once you break it down just on, on how people practice baptism, there's very few churches left. And we're Baptists, okay? We're Baptists because we baptize the way we do. But there's more to it than just that. There's more to it than just how we baptize, there are some hallmarks to a Baptist church, okay? So let me just go through the hallmarks of a Baptist church. Number one, churches are organized by other churches, okay? So a church begets another church, okay? You can't just get a group of buddies together and say, hey, let's just have a Baptist church. That's not how Baptists do it, right? Baptists um, ordain, send out, you know, they organize a church. Churches beget churches. And the idea of that comes from Genesis chapter 1, verse 25. I'll just read it to you. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So we're talking about creation, right? When God created the animals, when God created the grass and the trees, and God created uh, human beings, he made sure that they, could, uh, um, that they could reproduce after their kind. That's a basic Bible principle, right? And so we take that same approach, and God saw, God saw that it was good. So it's a good thing for a, a type of something to reproduce after its kind. Christians reproduce Christians. We go soul winning, we get people saved. That's the fruit of the Christians getting people saved. The fruit of a church is starting other churches, starting other churches. So that's hallmark number one. Churches are organized by other churches. Hallmark number two is that there are, the churches hold to two offices, the office of the deacon and the office of a bishop. Okay, so 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire for good work. So I'm, I'm a bishop, you know, I, I have the office of a bishop, the pastor of this church. And then 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 says, And let these also first be proved, then let them also use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. So in the Bible, there are two offices the office of a bishop, boys, boys, stop it. Office of a bishop and the office of a deacon, okay? Two offices held in the church, local church. The other third hallmark is there's two ordinances. The first ordinance is water baptism, which we've done. The second one being the Lord's table, which is the breaking of bread and the drinking of the wine or the grape juice, okay? We haven't done that just yet, but I do plan on doing that in the near future. So there's two ordinances the church believes in, the water baptism and the breaking of bread. And both of those ordinances have to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, right? The baptism, and then the breaking of bread that represents his broken body, and the grape juice representing the blood that was shed for us on Calvary. 
Number four, the fourth hallmark is that they're independent churches, self-governing churches. You know, there's not one church above another church. We've spoken about this already, why we're an independent church, right? I won't recover that, but basically we have Christ as our head and we're not governed by some other organization or some other church. Number five, church is made for saved believers. Okay, saved members. Churches are made up of saved members. It's not a free-for-all church for everybody. Anyone, of, look, anyone's welcome. All visitors are welcome. But we don't tailor the church for the world. Okay, we tailor the church for the believers so we can grow in maturity. We can grow in knowledge of the Lord. It's for saved members. Um, Acts, I'll just read Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And they that gladly received his word were baptized. We know that. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So after believers are saved, they're baptized, they're added to the church. Verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily. So the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Okay, it's the Lord's job. It's God's work to build the church. It's God's job to add to the church. Okay, so church is for saved members. Number six, the Bible is the final authority of faith and practice. The final authority, again, I've preached on that, why we're a fundamental church. Our foundation is the Bible. That's why we're fundamentalists. Last week's sermon, if you want to go, you can listen to that again to be repeated. But the Bible is the final authority of all faith and practice. Hallmark number seven, Jesus is the foundation and the head of the church. Okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Christ is the foundation of our church. And then Ephesians 5, 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. So whether the foundation or whether the head, that's what... And in between, we're in between that, right? Christ is our foundation and Christ is our head. The eighth hallmark of the Baptist church is the priesthood of the believer. The priesthood of the believer, also known as... Uh, individual soul liberty. Maybe you've heard of that instead. Lib uh, individual soul liberty. In other words, there's no intermediate between you and God. Okay, I'm not an intermediate uh, with you and God. The priesthood that we hold as believers is the same. It's equal across the board, whether that's me or whether that's you. It's the same for all believers. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay? And Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 says, and have made us kings and priests. Okay? And have made us kings and priests unto God and his Father to be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the Bible is very clear. Not only are we saved, but we're a priests. We have the priesthood of the believers. There's no intermediate. Right, right, between us and God. We can go directly to God, right? Meaning that you're responsible for yourself. You have to answer to God directly for yourself. You know, when, when God judges you by the works, you, it's not an excuse to say, well, you know, the pastor said this. Well, I heard this. No, you're responsible for what you believe. You're responsible for what you practice because there's no intermediary between you and God. The priesthood of the believer individual soul liberty. That means you're free to disagree with what I preach. Okay? You're free to disagree with what I preach. Of course, if you disagree on salvation, then get out of here. <laughs> All right? But uh, hallmark number nine, practice separation. These churches practice separation. Okay? That's separation from uh, uh, de denominational ties. Okay, not being lumped in into one denomination where you have a, 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 some, some pope or some president as your head. You know, we separate from that. We're independent churches. Okay, but that's not the only separation. You can separate from churches that teach conflicting positions on primary doctrines. Okay, now if we one day fellowship with a church, but we find that they're um, teaching heresy on primary doctrines, right, things that matter like on salvation, on, on the deity of Christ, they start preaching some other heresy like that, we ought to separate ourselves from those churches, okay? We need to make sure that the doctrine in this church remains as pure, as humanely possible at least, you know, with the power of God. Uh, so Romans chapter 16 verse 17, Romans chapter 16 verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. 
Okay, so that's a Bible doctrine to mark and avoid people that cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. Okay, now some people misapply this. Some people misapply and they say, well, you know, um, I'm marking people that are contrary to the things that were taught in church. No, it's contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. Where do we learn our doctrine? From the pastor? No, it's from the book. Okay, it's from the book. So the separation ought to come from the Bible. If they're, they're teaching heresy, we ought to separate ourselves, mark and avoid preachers that preach heresy. Okay? But also, we ought to also separate ourselves from believers that are in serious sin. Believers that are in serious sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. I'll get you to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll get you to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. It says, But now I have written unto you, not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother, okay, so this is a believer, someone that's been in the church faithfully for a long time, someone that's mature, that we say, hey, that's a brother in Christ. Uh, if they be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, six things I counted there, with such and one know not to eat. Okay, so there are, if there are believers in this church, that are doing these gross sins, right? These are things that you might think, oh, they're not that serious. But in God's eyes, they're serious. In God's eyes, they hurt a church. And if there's believers like this, it's my job to kick them out, okay? It's my job to kick them out. Now, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be kind as possible. I'll bring up that thing to their attention and see, you know, whether they can be repentant and turn from those things, and then they'll be accepted in the church. But if they're not repentant, they continue in the same sins, hey, we need to separate from those believers, why? Because we hate them? No, just so they can get right, so they can be disciplined, right? And realize, hey, I'm doing wrong, and they need to get themselves right with the Lord. So we practice separation. That's, that's point number nine. And the tenth hallmark of a Baptist church is the separation of church and state. The separation of church and state. What that means is that the government is a separate institution to the church. Okay? The government is a separate institution from the church. Okay? We don't want to cause our government. We don't want to control the government as a church. right? We don't want to cause the government to force people to choose Christianity. And that's a problem in the past. With the Roman Catholic Church, they had authority over kings and they would kill believers. They'd kill people that were trying to translate the Word of God into the common tongue. right? But it's not just the Roman Catholic Church that made this error. It was Protestants. Certain Protestants took power in government and again, they persecuted and killed Baptists. Protestants in the past killed Baptists, right? That's the problem when you mix these institutions which don't belong together. Churches are not to have authority in government, okay? Number one, I mean, why, do we, why would you want to force people into Christianity anyway? You're going to get false converts, and salvation is a personal choice. People have the free will whether to accept or reject Jesus Christ, okay? So government should not be run by a church but a government should uphold the laws of God. So, so it's still right for us to preach the laws of God and expect our government to uphold the, the laws of God, but it's not the church's responsibility to become the government, right? That's where you get into problems. So these are 10 hallmarks of a Baptist church. Okay? Not just baptism, but these are other things that identify a Baptist church. Okay. Now, moving on to a bit of history. Okay? A bit of history. Uh, look, I'm not that big on church history. I don't really spend a lot of time studying it, but I did obviously want to get a good feel of, of the Baptist history. And if I'm going to take that name, I'm going to take that label for the church, I obviously want to know what that means historically as well. Okay? Now just to give you some ideas, Acts 11 verse 26, if you can turn there, Acts 11 26. Acts 11 26. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Acts 11 26. <clears throat> Acts eleven twenty six says, and when he had found them, so and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Okay, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. I just want to show you that Christ did not call his disciples Christians. 
Okay? We're not called Christians because that's what God said we need to call ourselves. Okay? Now, these believers, they were called Christians later. Once Christ had resurrected, once the churches had spread out and had started, the preaching of the Word of God was going out throughout the whole world, others called them Christians. Prior to this, they were just called believers, they were just called disciples, they were just called the church. Some people called them the Nazarenes, some people called them the Galileans. But it was, this was the first time people started calling these believers, calling us, believers like us, Christians. Okay, so a lot of these labels come from other people, not labels that, were, that came up within the church themselves, right? These are labels given by other people. They were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, these Christians, the first and second centuries, they were known as Christians. So a bit of history... Then they were persecuted, they went out throughout the world, they were being murdered, they were being you know, killed by the Roman, um, by the, by the Roman uh, Caesars, and you know, they were, they were, you know, you've heard the stories of the Colosseums, they were killed by lions and just different ways of torturing these Christians. Then in the 3rd and 4th centuries, as they, they went out throughout Europe, many of them were, were known as um, Montanists, and, in, and other groups that had spread in other areas were called Nova, Novations. Novations and Montanists in the 3rd and 4th centuries, approximately. Okay? And then in the 5th and 6th centuries, they were known as Donatists and Anabaptists. Okay? Anabaptists. Okay, this is the first time that label Baptist really starts to pop up in history. And by Anabaptists, the reason they were called Anabaptists is because they were known as rebaptizers. Because, of course, the Roman Catholic Church were baptizing babies, the Orthodox Church were baptizing babies, and these these believers would come along and say, well, no, that's an invalid baptism. You know, you need to be baptized by immersion. You need to be a believer first and then be baptized. And so they were called by others, the Anabaptists, the rebaptizers, right? And, and throughout, this, throughout this time, many of these Anabaptists were, were killed. Some of them were, were, were drowned, right? They're like, well, if you want to be baptized by immersion, you know, they were, they were drowned in, the, in, in water because that's, you know, the Anabaptists, that's what they want to do. And, uh, you know, Christians throughout this time period were, were persecuted, not just by the Roman Catholic Church, but also by, by, also by uh, Protestants. Okay? And then in the 7th to the 12th centuries, they were known as Paulicians, right? Because they were teaching from the New Testament, and much of the New Testament was written by Paul. Uh, the term Anabaptist continued. Uh, then the 13th to the 15th centuries, they were known as the Albigenses, the Waldenses, I think the Waldenses were in, in Germany, from memory. And again, the name Anabaptist remained till that time. And then in the 6th century, that's where Baptists, the name Baptist really started to take root. Okay, they dropped that word Anna, and they were called just the Baptist, the 6th century till today. Okay, so the, the thought is that throughout church history, there were always believers like us, there were always churches that were independent. There were always churches that believed salvation by faith alone. There were always churches that believed baptism by immersion as a sign of what, of what you had believed. And, you know, the idea is that, you know, to this day, Baptists, that's what Baptists is sup supposed to represent. Baptists are not Protestants. Baptists are not Protestants. The Protestant movement started also in the 16th century, and they were churches that protested against Roman Catholicism. Churches that protested against Roman Catholicism, so like, you know, the Presbyterians, the, um, the uh, what else, the Methodists, you know, churches like that, they're Protestants. Okay, so Baptists are not Protestants, but often in these days, Baptists will be lumped in as Protestants by, by many people, okay? But I just want you to know, it did not follow that line. It did not follow the lineage of the Protestant movement. They, they, they were always independent churches, which is why we remain independent today. Okay, now, the name of a church. The name of a church. Most Baptist churches are named something Baptist church. Okay, now a lot of the, the first Baptist churches in Australia, you know, they took on the name of the, the suburb or the city they lived in. So they might be like the, like the Baptist Union church that I grew up in was Cabramatta Baptist Church because the suburb was Cabramatta. A lot of the Union churches are named by the suburb. And then uh, many of the independent Baptists, they came out of the Southern Baptists in the United States. They started to separate because of, of um, you know, being relaxed on the, on the Bible, um, being very liberal in their teachings, not taking the Bible seriously. The independent Baptist churches are often named by 
some, some type of word in the Bible, like Faith Baptist Church or Victory Baptist Church or something like that. You know, for, for a while, I, I thought of Blessed Assurance Baptist Church for the name of this church, Blessed Assurance, because, you know, people are so confused about eternal security. You know, that's something I wanted to reinforce. But, you know, there are, you know, we're called the church in Caloundra. And that might sound like really new and unique, but really it's not. You know, there are independent Baptist churches in Australia that don't have the name Baptist in it already. You know, I looked them up. You know, you might have such and such Bible church. Instead of Baptist church, there's such and such Bible church or such and such community church or such and such people's church or such and such fellowship. Even in Adelaide, <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but in Adelaide, there's an independent Baptist church called Church for You. <laughs> like literally church and then the, the number four and then the letter U. <laughs> church for You. It's very radical in, in the way they name their church. But the reason why I went with the church in Caloundra um, and not such and such Baptist church, number one, obviously I was sent by the church in Punchbowl, okay? Well, maybe that's not number one reason, but that's one of the reasons, okay? And when I heard about it, I, I liked it. I love the fact that, hey, you know, the churches in the New Testament are known like that. You know, they, they, that's the naming convention. I'm not saying that was their registered government name or their charity name, right? But that's what they were labeled. That's what they were known as. You know, let me give you some examples. You know, obviously the seven churches in, in Revelation, right? The church in Ephesus, the church in Smyrna, the church in Pegamos, the church in Thyatira, the church in Sardis, the church in Philadelphia, the church of the Laodiceans. Okay, the seven churches in the book of Revelation. But also throughout your Bible, you're going to find other ones. The church which was... The church which is in Jerusalem, the church which, which was at Antioch, the church of the Thessalonians, the church of the Cretans, the church at Centria. Just some other labels, names that you'll see in the Bible. Okay? Some other interesting things. Israel in the Old Testament, what were they called in the New Testament? The church in the wilderness. Right? The church in the wilderness. And the future church to come, believers when they gathered up in heaven, the Bible refers to that as the church of the firstborn church of the firstborn. So I like the idea, hey, you know what? Yes, we're a Baptist church, you know, and yes, I do in a, in a way honor the history, all right, and, you know, somewhat the tradition of the Baptist. You know, not all tradition is bad as long as it's not wrong and sinful or anti-biblical, right? I, I, I do honor the past, right? But more importantly than looking at the history, I wanted to look at the New Testament and say, hey, we want to be a church that's patterned after the New, New Testament churches. And I love the idea of having the church in Caloundra because that just that fo puts our focus back on the New Testament church. Okay? Because I'll tell you what, there are people out there, there are people out there that are so Baptist. Right? I, I think they're more Baptist than they're believers. <laughs> right? They're so uh, taken with the history, taken with past Baptist preachers. You know, instead of uh, you know, they might get behind a pulpit and instead of preaching the Bible, they'll preach comments from their favorite Baptist preacher in the past and stories of their fa famous Baptists. They're just like the Protestants. The Protestants love to go back to their John Calvins and back to their, uh, you know, um, I don't know, John Knox's and their... Uh, who's the guy that's, that, that hammered the thesis on the... Luther. They love to go back to their, you know, Luther. In fact, just, you know, when I was with Michael, we went so... I, I mentioned this, this, this pastor that we you know, that we preached to. And Michael asked the question, do you believe in eternal security? Do you believe that we can never lose our salvation? And you know what his response was? He didn't go back to the Bible. He said, well, Wesley believed in once saved, always saved. Uh, but Calvin believed in eternal security. Or something, I don't know if I mixed them up. Something like that. I'm like, what? what? <laughs> Is that how you base your, your, your doctrine? Is that, you know, going back to these men of old? But you know, independent Baptists do the same thing. They love to go back to their Spurgeons, the Charles Spurgeons, or their, I don't know, even, even good men like, like John R. Rice, Rice, John Rice, and is it John Rice? I can't remember. Um, and uh, the Jack Hiles, they love to go back. What these men said and what they preached, right? Hey, okay, you know, they might have done good works, but they're gone now. It's up to you now. You need to get back into the Bible and, and preach and, and try, to, try to better than them. You know, try to be better. Try to do more for the Lord than what these people did in the past. So, you know, I wanted to move away from that idea. You know, I didn't want to be like the Protestants going back and holding these traditions, you know. And, and uh, you know, if the Word of God is contrary to those traditions, then fine. You know, we'll go with the Word of God. That was important for me. And, you know, one thing that, that surprises me, Matthew gave us his testimony on Sunday. 
Um, I thought all Baptists baptized by immersion. Well, his testimony said he went to a Baptist church and he was, he was sprinkled as a baby. Is that right? I mean, I, I didn't even know Baptists did that. So the, the label Baptist just seems to be losing its, you know, losing its importance anyway. But I do believe, you know, we do stand for what, a, what, what traditional baptism stood for. Why? Because it's biblical. The biblical uh, practice of baptism. Um, so yeah, we're the church in Caloundra. Now, that's pretty much all I had for you guys today. We are a Baptist church, okay? We're an independent church. We're a fundamental church. We're a Baptist church. We're not an independent fundamental Baptist denomination, okay? I didn't just take those words for no reason. They mean something to me. They mean something to me. When I first wanted to get serious in the Lord, when I wanted to find a church that I could learn from and grow from, I wanted to find a church. I wanted to find churches that were teaching the Bible. I wanted to find churches that were teaching without compromise, that stood on the truth of the Word of God. And in my journey, I actually didn't, did not want to attend a Baptist church. Why? Because I grew up in a Baptist Union church and I knew they were watered down. I knew they were teaching just stuff that didn't help you grow spiritually. Right? And I thought they were all the same. So I thought I didn't want to be part of a Baptist church when I got serious okay, in the Bible. But in my research, it led me to the Independent Fundamental Baptists. Okay? I believe that movement of churches is the closest that you're going to get in the Scriptures. Again, no church is perfect. Okay? There's no such thing as a perfect preacher. There's no such thing as a perfect church. But I do believe this movement of churches are the closest that you're going to find that pattern themselves after the New Testament churches. So we're an Independent Fundamental Baptist church. Let's pray.